Hi, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj. And on this podcast, we're going to talk about some deep stuff. I'm here to tell you that you're amazing. And often, the only person who can't see that is you. No matter who you are, what you do, or where you're from, there's greatness in you. Let's talk about it. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj, life, business, and relationship coach, and welcome to the Transformation Starts Today podcast, where I interview leaders, champions, and high performers from all walks of life as they share their story, lessons they learned along the way, and empowering perspectives to help you create an extraordinary life without regret starting today. Today we have with us a man who knows what it means to bet on himself, to go after and get what he wants, and a friend of mine, Michael Ketchin. Michael is a former educator turned full-time real estate investor. In the last four years, Michael, along with his team at Commonwealth Collective LLC, has scaled from a $40,000 HELOC to a $40 million real estate portfolio. Now with his podcast, Tell Us Why, he is looking to grow a community of financial freedom seekers, entrepreneurs, and anyone looking to bet on themselves. Michael, it is an honor to have you with us, brother. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for being here. Uh, again, I was honored to be asked. Anyone who knows you knows your kind of positivity and, and you're definitely one of my favorite people. So I'm excited to be here to talk with you. Thank you so much, man. Every, anyone who's tuning in, appreciate you taking the time to be with us. This will be a powerful conversation and I know you'll get so much out of this. And so Michael, for my audience who isn't familiar yet with you, they don't know your story. You know, I have found that each of us is the hero of our own story. And we've experienced challenges and setbacks and adversities that we've overcome to get to where we oh, are yeah. today. And can you please share with us what is your hero story? Yeah, um, I kind of like that phrase. I never thought of it that way, but uh, I am such a big believer in the way we talk to ourselves is so important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my wife likes to joke, but I remember being all the way back in fourth grade and for some reason, so I'm just snapped and I said, you know, I'm the man. I had to start telling myself that. And I, I mean that in a way, like, you know, there's everything I can be better at, but it really is the power going back to being like, you know, why, like, why am I settling for anything else? So with that said, uh, you know, the quick and dirty version is, raised by an unbelievable woman, an unbelievable single mother uh, who gave me everything except financial literacy. Uh, she was too busy working two jobs, trying to put food on the table for me and my two little brothers. And fast forward, um, I always liked business, I always liked finding money and hustling, but I was financially illiterate. Uh, then I met my wife, far and away the most impactful person I've ever met. Mm. Uh, really had to humble myself, gave her control of the finances. Like, I think I was 24, 26, something at the time. But essentially, she was in college, and I really had my kind of wake-up moment. When I'm working now, I'm a few years older than her. I'm getting paid on Friday, and I'm broke by Saturday. And my wife is in college. Somehow, graduating, she paid for our wedding. She bought our first house with a down payment. And I'm looking at it going, what the hell am I doing? There has to be another way. And through that journey and through finally talking to her and kind of giving control of that, we kind of got on this path of, of financial literacy. And, you know, fast forward, I was in education at the time, and I was part of turning around what is the most successful uh, high school turnaround in this country's history in Massachusetts of an urban school. And I was burnt out, man. I was 33. They thought I had a heart attack doing my job. Mm. And I said, there has to be something else. My father passed away at 47. You know, I'm 37 now. But in that moment, you know, I talked to Hannah and again, back to why she is such an impactful, such an important part of what I do. She's also my business partner. She was getting burnt out commuting every day. I was getting burnt out doing this. And I go, what is the point of this? Like, what are we doing here? You know, it was the point that, you know, she wakes up at 4.30 and drives an hour into Boston, gets home at 7.30. We see each other for an hour and do it all over again. Like, this seems backwards. Mm -hmm. So we said, there has to be another way. We sat down, we came up with a plan, which is now kind of what we do with Tell Us Why. I put everybody through the same plan. And in, it's been five years in the business, but about two and a half, three years in, we became financially free and, that's where we are today. I love that, man. Can you, uh, first of all, congratulations. Uh, it's an you, amazing brother. journey that you've been on. Can you speak to the importance, because I think it'll benefit so many people, of being financially literate? Yeah, and you know what? I even go a step further. We're trying to coin this. I haven't financial literate anymore. We want financial comprehension. Mm -hmm. um, I think we really need to change the narrative around this and why I say that and why I'm such a big believer in this. Financial literacy is being able to read. Financial comprehension is being able to understand, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So the biggest, if you look at most of the, the majority of the issues, in my opinion, is most things in this country can be tied, in, the, in this world really, can be tied back to uh, the money and the monetary system and how it works. And those that understand it and those that don't. Yeah. And I go so far to speak to this where I believe that the game is rigged, but it's not rigged in the way they like us to think it's rigged. It's rigged in the way that somehow people have been fooled into accepting they're only worth what they've been told they're worth. Mm. Once you realize there are no limits, there's truly no limits, and you realize it's just a game and you can play to win on your terms, sky's the limit. You can take off. And that's, that's kind of why I think until you understand how finance works and how assets versus liabilities and leverage and time of transactions versus total transactions and the way we really look at money. Um, and so you make that shift. Uh, you know, I don't, I, I truly just, you know, I, I was on a podcast today. I'll give you an example. Dr. Jamil, do you know what the biggest expense of your lifetime and my lifetime is? What's the biggest expense in your lifetime? The money that I could be making that I'm not. No. <laughs> That's what most people think. People think people think their wife, their spouse, their money. The biggest expense in your lifetime and my lifetime is your government. Mm. So until you understand that biggest expense, that elephant in the room, and then how to optimize to cut down that expense, you will never be financially free. Yep. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And yeah. once you understand that and start to make that adjustment, you start to get on that path. And that's kind of really what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. I want to I want to share something. So for, you know, I definitely agree with that um, as it relates to where the money goes and where it gets taken from. And absolutely. And I want to point out this was shared with me by a mentor of mine years ago. And I, I, when I really sat with it. That's why I answered it the way that I did. For everyone listening, it's like what Michael said, when you realize that you can play this, this is the game and you can play it to win, but you got to learn the rules. And when you do that, the sky is the limit. So notice that in my answer, the biggest expense is what I could be making that I'm not because I don't know what I don't know. And mm -hmm. so in a way, it's almost like because the sky is the limit, just using like a visual representation, if there's like a barometer and 100 is that limit, well, if I'm at 12, yep. not knowing what I don't know is costing me the 82 or the 88 rather th that, that I yep. could have, you know? And so I definitely hear you on that. I know for me, my, my relationship with money over the years when I was younger, you know, Never got taught that, like most people, I'd imagine. And then mm -hmm. as I got into reading, and I think um, what the first book that really opened my eyes to it, which I hear from, because I, I work with a lot of people in the real estate space, <laughs> like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, is like, that was like pretty much the first one that I read that just as simple balance sheets and assets and liabilities, and like it just opened things up to me. Of, okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then I started well, expanding onto it. Is it what you mean? It, I I, well, because I was going to say there, what, what I don't think it's talked about enough, and I, and I want to give a real old application. You just hit the nail on the head. That's what I said about the game being rigged. Okay, I'll use me and you as two examples. We both went, you know, graduated high school, went to college, because it was the thing you did, right? We went to continued education because it's the thing you did. Mm. You make money in a certain way because it's the thing that you do. It's what everyone does. Yeah. So there is this structure placed in society that says you do A, B, C, D, E. And the further you go along that nice, neat little path, you get a couple more reward, rewards and a little bit nicer house, a little bit nicer car. And they don't like it when people go outside of that box because they start to realize, wait a minute, there is another way. I yeah. can have all of this on my terms, right? Hmm. So there's people don't realize how big, you know, the entire economy is built on consumerism. A lot of money goes into make you think like a consumer. A lot of money goes into make you think like an employee. You are trained a certain way, basically from the moment you start school, your whole circle of trust, the people all around you doing the safe thing, doing the traditional thing. You are being conditioned from the moment you take your first breath. So when you go against that on this journey to financial freedom, that's what I try to tell people. It doesn't happen overnight because you're not going, it's like going to the gym, right? You're not going to go max out and have a six pack on day one. Yeah. Sometimes. You know, you, you have to put the work in before you, you see it because you're trying to untrain your mind and then the people that you're associated with that you spend time with, the people you trust more than anyone else in this world, they think you're nuts when you go to do this. That's yeah. risky. That's not safe. And then the best part is when you make it and you become successful, well, now you're lucky. 
Yep. Now you're fortunate. So, <laughs> it had nothing to do with what you did. Yeah, yeah you know, it, it's, it, it's, you know, someone said, I read this great book uh, that was recommended on the podcast uh, called Chop Wood, Carry Water. And he had this great lesson about bamboo. And I go, oh my God, that, that's business. And he nailed it. Where the way bamboo grows, yep. you know, you water it every day and for years. I think he says like five years, you don't see anything. Then all of a sudden in six months, it goes up like 90 feet straight. Yep. I go, that is business. We are so focused on results. But if we all just looked at the process, you would understand the risk taken on this path to financial freedom. Absolutely. I love the bamboo metaphor. I'm familiar with it. And for everyone listening, you know, Michael already opened it up, but I want to just kind of add something to it that I think is really useful. I, I first learned this from uh, Les Brown. He's a motivational speaker. It was really big in like, I think the 80s and the 90s, and he's still alive and does his thing now. And look him up on YouTube. The guy's awesome. And so he tells this story about you type in Les Brown bamboo tree. I'll give you the, the general version yeah. of it now. And so you plant the bamboo tree and you tell people, I'm planting a bamboo tree. And, you know, let's say you're in the middle of like a place where there's no bamboo. So no one knows what that is. And they're like, hey, you know, you sure? Why are you doing that? You're crazy. Like all the stuff mm -hmm. you're telling me about. And then they plant it. And every day you show up and you water it. But for five years, nothing breaks the surface of the soil. So the, your neighbor who's been looking at you for over periods of you know, hours and days approaches you one day and says, hey, man, what are you doing? Uh, well, I'm just, well, yeah, the word around town is, you know, you're growing a Chinese bamboo tree. <laughs> and then he goes, is that right? And he goes, yeah, that's right. And then the Les Brown joke is he says, um, well, you know, even, uh, what was it, Ray Charles and Stevie Wonder can see that nothing's growing. <laughs> oh, and, and, he, and he says that joke and everyone starts laughing. And this idea that other people weren't given the dream or the vision that was given to you. And so they don't see it. But what you don't see is that it takes five years because under the surface of the soil, the roots are growing like crazy. So there's all this, in, in, from a metaphorical perspective, you're learning all the things you don't know. You're breaking the old habits that have been holding you back. You're beginning the process that needs to kind of compound over time. Yep. But eventually, when you break that soil, like the bamboo tree, you know, it grows, was it 90 feet in 60 days or the opposite? Oh, yeah, it's, it, it's insane. And it's the flywheel, the momentum you don't see behind it. Yeah. Right? And that's, that's the whole thing is that, if you're in this and you're grinding and, and you're on this journey, it's like we like to say every year, right? If your problems don't terrify you every year and get bigger, you're not thinking big enough. Mm. And I look back now on like what we're dealing with today. If you had set me down three, four years ago and said, this would be my problem. I think we made it. I'm done. But that fire inside, right? That fire inside continues to burn. The why, right? My podcast tells us why we talked about that. Why is going to change over time. But once it gives you that target to aim at, I mean, I do think you have to be obsessed. You know, we talked about this. I think that's going to be in your DNA. I find that more successful people I get around, we're all obsessed to a varying degrees. Some of us are a little nuttier than the others. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think my wife would agree to that. I'm a little, I'm a little off kilt, but you know, it, it's, it really is. It's, you start to see these common themes and it's just, it's fascinating to me because there is no blueprint, but there's resources everywhere. Yes. You know, it's like, and like you said something at the start of this, that was perfect. I never thought of it that way. I love it. I'm going to steal that. You are the hero of your own story because there are resources. There are, you know, I can sit here and talk to you about how, how we buy real estate, how we do deals. You might get some nuggets, but until you do it your way, yes. it's, it's not the same as real, you know, uh, experience. Oh yeah. So you're going to have to go through those, those peaks and valleys yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's just that idea of if you want to learn how to swim, you could get into the water or you can buy a book on swimming <laughs> but if you buy the book on swimming, you might theoretically get it. But when you jump in the water, you're going to panic and you got no idea what you're doing. And Absolutely. so it's what you learn by doing. Now, so, and that, that applies to everything. Now, something, well, I actually want to comment on that before I move forward. I remember I, when I was in Arizona not during med school, I used to give a lot of you know, personal development talks and like try to like kind of motivate people, inspire them, coach them in a way in more of a group setting. And I remember sharing something that really, it seems obvious when I say it right now, but for so many of us, we're just not on our radar. I said something to the extent of, if you're not, if you've never done something before and then you try it, you should expect it to go badly, not expect it to go yes. great. And if you never did it before yeah. and then you try it with the expectation that somehow it's gonna go really well and then it doesn't, but because of the expectation, you then say, well, I guess I'm not cut out for this or I guess it's not meant to be or I'm not good at that. It's like, of course you're not good at that. You've never done it. 
but it takes time. You are so, I, I'll give you a quick story from today. Literally today, I gave my team our meeting. Um, we've now scaled beyond me, Matt and Hannah. We have, we have people working for us. Guys, I've been recruiting for years. I'm so happy to have on the team. Now taking on our day-to-day operations. And we're in the middle of this giant project, our biggest project ever. We're, we're stabilizing the toughest building in New England. I mean, I'm dealing with private security. I've got massive drugs being funneled through. I'm dealing with police. I'm, you name it. I could go on for hours. But we also have components of our day-to-day operations. And a guy working for me, I hired him because I trust him. Hmm. And because I turned around to school with him, and I knew this was harder. Well, fast forward to today, to your exact point. His personality, though, he tries to make everything perfect. So I finally said, stop waiting for perfect. Hurry the bleep up and fail. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I want you to go do this. I know you're going to fail. I write your paycheck. I don't care that you're going to fail. Because when you fail, we'll then be able to adjust in real time. Yes. Paralysis by analysis is real. We got to get punched in the face and then respond. You know, and that's that that's business. That's entrepreneurship. Absolutely. And for everyone listening, a lot of people listening, you know, are business owners, entrepreneurs, business professionals. And at the same time, even if that person isn't, the perspective of failure isn't the problem or to be avoided. Failure is how you get to success. But also keep in mind that I I said this on a different podcast possibly one of my own or one of them I was on, I've put a lot of them. But this idea of keep in mind also that failure is a concept. Failure doesn't exist. You fail when you declare that you failed. At the end of the day, it's like, a, I like to use the scientist experiment perspective of, I'm gonna try something with the intention of what I wanna happen, have happen. And depending on, we'll see how it goes. And if it doesn't work out because there's a lot I didn't know, I didn't do it right, whatever the case is, it's like, oh, new data, feedback, and then learn from it and then do it better again. When you treat it like an experiment, you're willing to consistently try and give effort and do it again and again and again. And that's the recipe to get where you want to be. But if you come from that space of, oh no, if I fail, then you make a story up. I'm going to get fired. They're not going to like me. I'm not going to be loved. Um, people are going to laugh at me. Well, whatever thing you make up, I, I, I won't be successful in the eyes of other people. That Just that thought is going to prevent you and put a cap on that level of success you'll experience in your life because you're not willing to try. You just said something so impactful that it ties to culture, it ties to norms. Again, it ties to the way we talk to ourselves. Elon Musk came out a couple months ago with a, a quote. I'm trying to get it framed in a picture. I'm trying to find the right way because I want to hammer this point home to my team at nausea. Mm. Elon Musk said, try to do your 10-year plan in six months. Yes, you're going to fail but you're going to be a hell of a lot closer to your 10 year goal than had you not. This is the richest, wealthiest man in the world. He just gave you the blueprint. If you cannot see the forest through the trees, and this goes back to the mindset shift, right? We talked about rich dad, poor dad and that circle of influence and why it's so important. I love to tell the story. Rich dad, poor dad came to me actually at 21 years old. I, I graduated. I just started being a teacher. Um, a buddy of mine gave it to me on audio CDs back in the day. This is 2007. Yeah. And I said, I don't really understand it, but I mean, it seems good. And everybody in my circle of influence at that time, oh, this is a scam. Oh, this doesn't work. Oh, you have to play it safe. What about your degree? Fast forward 10 years later, when I read it again as a 31 year old, now transitioning into my own investing career with more confidence, more, I don't really care what any of you, you people say, there's got to be another way. I'm living that life. His blueprint is literally what I'm doing. Yeah. But my circle of influence is so impactful. I didn't have enough belief and enough knowledge in myself to push and go seek answers from others. So that the people you're around are so impactful. Something as simple as what Elon just said. Not everyone is going to get that because they're not ready to understand it. That goes back to that financial literacy, financial comprehension. You know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. Like one of the things in a similar way to what Elon says, I often say this when I am, people are asking me, you know, what do you do? How do you work with people? And one of the things that I say, because I know it's true, I've seen it work. Let's say you have a goal, you have a vision, you have a dream, and you think it'll take you 10 years. I'll help you make it real in 10 months. And it's like from that perspective of it's compression of time. But it's like you said, if you come like Elon, like for like the Elon quote, the way I interpret it, if you've got a 10 year goal and you set out to be so crazy ambitious that you're going to accomplish it in six months. Well, you won't know that you quote unquote failed until six months. So what are you going to do? I mean, every day you are going to be taking so much action. You're going to be taking what might be perceived as a lot of risks because you're going to be asking, 
big asks. You're going to be talking to people, asking for things that maybe you might've been shy about before, but you, you're not now because you don't have time to be shy. You got yep. five and a half months left to make yep. this 10 year goal happen. And then let's say to his point, I'd imagine this is what he meant at the end of six months. Well, you didn't hit it, but now you're going to hit it in like a year or two instead of 10. Absolutely. And then you just hit the nail on the head. And now imagine doing that three or four times over your lifetime, the compounding return. And that's why I tell people every decision compounds either positive or negatively. Right. Yeah. And again, back to that thinking, once you start thinking that way and realizing it's a game, you start realizing there's an ROI, a return of investment on everything, right? Yes. Sitting here doing this podcast with you today, there's an ROI on this. We know what this is. Some people might say, oh, they're nuts. You know, they're talking about this stuff. We know because we're in that space now. We understand where we're at, the impact that our words have on ourselves, on each other, those around us, what we're doing, what our mission is. That work might not show up for decades, yeah. but it bears that fruit. It lays that path and it compounds positively I would say over negatively and every decision does. Yeah. Something that I wrote down here when you were sharing your story initially, you were saying like, you know, there has to be something else and what am I doing here? And I, I think that many people who are listening either are there right now or they can relate to it in the past. Mm -hmm. This perspective of I'm looking at my life as it is lived currently and I don't even like recognize myself. Like who am I? How did I get here? Maybe I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I, I'm years, months, decades, whatever it is into doing something for work, let's say that doesn't fulfill me. It's not what I want to do. And like you said, it's not on my own terms. It's not living life according to me. And you talked about this idea that most people, the ones who would be the, even most of the time it's coming from love. This like yep. criticism of, Hey, what are you doing? Slow down. You don't got to do that. You're crazy. That idea of play it safe. And I want everyone to take this to heart. My perspective not saying it's truth. It playing it safe isn't let me do what I don't want to do because it gives me a steady paycheck. That's actually spiritual suicide. Playing it safe or not really to playing it safe would be I'm going to go after my goals and dreams and give it everything I've got because that's the only possibility of actually making it real. And then if for whatever reason I try that and it doesn't work, A, I can you know shift it and do it again. But if if then I want to go and work somewhere, okay, I'll do that. Nothing wrong with being an employee somewhere. If somebody wants to do that, beautiful. But I, like, I don't, like I said before, failure to me as a concept doesn't exist. But if there were to be a failure, to me, it's, I really would love to do this and I'm going to give up. That to me would be failure. Quitting is not failure. If I realize at some point, hey, I'm going in a certain direction. I thought this is what I wanted. It isn't. I changed my mind. We can do that. You know, <laughs> and so I changed my mind over time. I realized I actually want to go in a whole different direction. Yeah. And then you quit. You know, growing up, I used to always hear people say those little phrases like, don't be a quitter. Quitters never win, stuff like that. And I disagree. It's like quitting can be amazing if you're quitting for the right reason. If you're quitting because it's no longer in alignment with the life you want to live. But the moment you quit at something that's so meaningful for you that you would love to see come to manifestation, but you quit because it's hard. That to me is where it's going to lead to a lot of regret. And I talked about earlier, the people I work with, I, I want to help them create that extraordinary life without regret. And so point, uh, going back to what Michael said, here I am, there has to be something else. What am I doing here? And then like, I don't know what I don't know. I got to figure this out. And then he learned it. And then I think he said within two years of doing all that, now he's financially free with his family. Mm -hmm. Now, what could be possible for you? Everyone is listening. Your life looks however it looks right now. And you might buy into the story. Well, you know, my parents made this amount of money. My grandparents made that amount of money. This is where my life is now. And you're almost trying to justify and argue for your limitation. And there's an expression when you argue for your limitation, you get to keep them. And so if you're going to be willing to let that go and say, like Michael said, there's resources all around you. There's a podcast like this that maybe is a wake-up call. There's books out there that you can even get for free online as PDFs or, or yep. the book itself is like 10 bucks. There's mastermind groups, there's mentorship, there's coaching, there's friends you could talk to that maybe have the success that you want. There's social media accounts you could follow. It's all out there available. Now the question is, like Michael said, are you ready for it? And then are you going to choose it? And then every day are you going to recommit to choosing it? Because like Michael said, oh, I thought the problem, if, if this was my problem now, I'm, I'm set. But no, because as you grow and expand, 
the quote unquote problems get bigger, but you also love what you're doing. So you're kind of up to the challenge, right? And so it's like, you think about it as my life could be so different tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, even this next moment, if I just make a new decision, different from any decision I've made before. And I'll pause there. And no, I was going to say it's spot on. And what was coming to me as you were saying it is I'm, I'm replaying the last few years of my own life in my own head. And, you know, the way we grow and the way we adapt and the choices we make. And, you know, it really hit me when you were saying it, you really do. You have to fall in love with the process. Yeah. Right. And I, I don't, I, I still, I mean, I am in a place financially I never thought I would be in. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trading number. I, I literally deposited three six figure checks today. I'm like, like who does this? And now I'm just going through a drive through versus a few years ago. If there was a $10,000 decision about, Oh my God, you know, but where I go with that is I still don't feel like I've arrived. I, I, I'm a, I'm a small fish in a very big pond. And that's what I try to tell people. It's all just a game right now. If you're the smartest guy in the room you're in, it is true. You're in the wrong room. If you think you've arrived or you've made it, you're going to become complacent and complacency is the enemy. In my opinion, you need to fall in love with the process. And this goes back to choosing your goals and your coaching and your financial literacy, your comprehension. It all ties together. If you were to say that I am, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever you're at, and I've arrived and I've got everything perfect, I personally don't think that's how humans are wired to be. I think something is missing. I think we always need a purpose. What we get to choose is what that purpose is and what we're pursuing, right? Back to that why question. It changes over time. Now I'm chasing goals that a couple of years ago I would have killed to even be thinking about. I had to shift my thinking and grow, but guess what? The person I was then wasn't ready to chase this goal because I, I didn't have the knowledge I needed. Yes. It takes time. I fell in love with the process, the grind. A guy who works for me now, he's a good, he's been a lifelong friend. He worked for us. He said, man, that stressful butterfly feeling that, that you get. I said, yeah. He goes, you guys create that every day. That's what you like. I never thought of it that way, but I said, yeah, I guess we kind of do. Yeah, like, yeah. It, 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 it's go time. You know, our company slogan is GSD, you know, get shit done. It's, it's, <laughs> you just, it's go time, but we're in love with the process. We're not necessarily in love with the result. And I just, I, I was thinking of that as, as you were talking, it just really go back and listen to what Dr. Jamil said, because you hit the nail on the head. You really have to get enamored with this and it's okay to fail. It is not okay to quit. They're two very different things. And you got to understand that difference. You know, I, I said a couple of weeks ago, and I truly believe this, everyone can be wealthy. Not everyone will be wealthy. You need to know the difference. There, there really yeah. is something there. It yeah. reminds me right now, as you say it, of a Bill Gates quote that I heard years ago. And I think there's nuances to it because depending on certain areas in the world and things like that, but especially if you're listening to this podcast, more than likely this quote applies to you. Bill Gates said, if you're born poor, that's not your fault. But if you die poor, that's your fault. And when I thought yeah. about that, I heard that when I was I think, a teenager and, uh, I think, I think, again, there's more nuances to it, I think, but at the same time, it's to what we're talking about. You know, every day you wake up, first of all, that's a gift right there because it's not guaranteed. And every day that you wake up, well, what are you doing about that? What are you doing to learn? What are you doing to grow? What are you doing to expand? What are you doing to contribute? And what are you doing like, to get uncomfortable? Yeah, what are you doing to what push you, past that comfort zone? Again, are you, are you working? Are you, are, are you doing the same workout with the same people? Are you going there to have other people, uh, are the things you put in on social media to make you look good because you're more concerned about what someone else thinks or you're actually investing in yourself, right? You know, you want to grow, go get uncomfortable. Go be the, go purposely be the worst at something, Yes. right? Go, go pick up a new hobby for nothing more than to know that I'm going to grind at this, right? I'm going to grind at this. I'm going to fall in love with the process. This is going to hurt and I'm going to do it. You will start to learn yourself when you humble yourself. Go get uncomfortable. And you hit the nail on the head. And I'm going to say it. You're, you're way more polite than I am. If you were born in America, listen, I don't want to hear your victim shit. I don't want to hear your excuses. I don't want to hear your nuance. We take so many things for granted in this country. You hit the nail on the head. There are parts of this world where people are, are fighting, scratching, clawing to come to this great land. We are in a land of opportunity. You cannot control where you're born, how you're born, what you're born. You can't control any of that. You can control how you respond and react to all of it. Yeah. That's what you have to do. You have to make those decisions. You have to own those decisions, good, bad, and ugly. Own it, take total accountability, and I guarantee you be on your way. Yeah, well, well said. Something that comes to mind when you're talking about falling in love with the process, 
there's a distinction that I share with my clients all the time. This idea that you can either do something in order to get happy, or you can do something happily. And when I think about that distinction, I want you to notice everyone listening that you, you have that choice. The first one is the trap that the vast majority of us run into. And some of us say there our whole life and some of us figure it out at some point and get out of it. And the idea is that when I get to a certain point, certain amount of money, certain place I live, certain amount of stuff, you know, collected reputation, status, uh, whatever it is, then I'm successful. Then I can be happy. Then I, then I, you know, whatever that is. The problem is you're basically, you're always kicking the can down the road. And so you never experience it now. And so the whole time on your journey, it's, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. There's never, because you're not loving the process. It's all about the outcome. And then if, and when you do get to the outcome, because you like kind of spent so much time at some point, the shine of it, the luster wears off. And then you go, well, maybe I got to set a new goal. And then you repeat that process. And then you wonder why you're not happy. But the flip side, I'm going to do what I do happily. So if I'm at A and B is, let's say, the goal, and I go, okay, I love that. I want to do that. So first of all, the direction is in the right. I'm doing it for me, not for like anybody else. Like, I love that. And every day, part of that process, the day by day, the actions that I take, I fall in love with that. And I do that happily, knowing that the goal will happen when the goal happens. I'll do everything I got to do to make it happen. And I love my day-to-day -day life. And when you come from that space, it changes everything I found. And um, to your point, there was a training that I did, a psychology training years ago. And there is, we broke, got broken up into groups. And there was this woman who had a challenge. And kind of the assignment they were saying is, everyone listen to this person's challenge. And then like, basically, give her a reframe, a way of looking at it differently. Mm -hmm. And she's telling me, oh, yeah, you, my business is so busy. And I've got no time for anything else. And I'm just basically, I'm swamped all the, I, I can't do anything. I have no time. And so like 10 people went before me. And then when it was my turn, I just looked at her and I said, are the problems you're having now, the problems you prayed you would have five years ago? And she looked at me, the draw, the jaw dropped, the eyes opened up and she just said, oh my God. Uh, and I go, tell me about uh, five years ago. Cause uh, she started her business five years ago. And she goes, five years ago, opened up my doors. Nobody was there, no money. I was like begging, I just, God, universe, something like I need people. And now she's got it more than she can handle. And now it's a problem. But it, to, well, we forget where we came from and we forget we lose the perspective. And so as you're doing something happily, part of that process, at least for me, is once a day, once a week, once a month, at least take a time to reflect on where you've come from and see, wow, where was I in my fitness journey, my, my financial journey, my health journey? six months ago, a year ago, three years ago, because right now you might be telling yourself some sob story. You're feeling bad about where you're at, but then you look back and you go, hold on a second. I have like 400% growth over like a yep. year or two. And yet I'm putting myself down right now. And it's not going to be any different a year or two from now. You're going to grow it consistently. So when you do that, you remember where you came from, you keep the perspective in check. And like you said, also, you know, we grow up in, in, in America or anywhere else that's like, you know, you know, equivalent, let's say, in terms of the opportunity, you being as successful as you possibly can be allows you to make the biggest impact in the world that you can possibly have. And so I think it was a Jay-Z song and he has this line, he said, I realized that the greatest way to help the poor is not to be one of them. Yeah. And it's like that same idea, same idea. It's just, you know, I'm going to be as successful as I possibly can be. I'm going to make as much money as I possibly can make. And I'm going to do the most amount of good in the world I can possibly do. Can what I, can I try to jump in on that? Like, because yeah. what you just said that people don't realize is stay, stay with the example you just gave the visualization. Think of how two people are going to hear that. Some people are going to say, yeah, lucky this, lucky that. You know, I was listening to Reasonable Doubt back in 1996. There was no luck involved. The other ones are going to say, well, if him, why not I, right? Yeah. And you got to be around the people who think in terms of problem solving, not problem creating, yeah. right? If he can do it, there's a path. It's not clear to me yet, but there is a path. There's a way. Versus if everyone around you is negative and, and cancerous and, well, this is luck or this is unfortunate or my, my shitty job or my shitty situation or, you know, whatever it is. They're not taking back to that accountability piece. I'm, I'm so big on it. I scream about it so much because people don't get it. 
you're never going to be in control of what happens to you. Everything that happens to us, the majority of it's out of our control. How we respond to it, though, is so 100% in our control. You have to make that shift. I truly, truly believe that before anything else. If you are not ready to be honest with yourself and earn the things and, and, and take total ownership of the things that happen to you and be prepared to have that conversation and that mindset, I, I truly think you will never reach your maximum potential because you can never be totally in control of your life. Yeah. Above everything else. That's my biggest, biggest thing. I say that all the time. Yeah, man, absolutely. And I think this is a great segue. I said in the beginning that you are someone who really knows what it means to bet on yourself. And with that in mind, can you share with us the importance of betting on yourself? Absolutely. I mean, I, you know, back to that point and that why, I mean, I, I again, I'll, I'll give her another shout out. Uh, my wife, went back to that whole, you know, what is it, right? You know, what do we want? Well, we decided to design a life that was around us. There's been times it's been very stressful over the past few years. There's been times it's crazy. But betting on yourself essentially says, I am going to figure out this game called life on my terms and do it my way. I'm going to defy my own measure of success. And then I'm going to start with that goal. I'm going to work backwards and I'm going to start marching towards it every day. And when you make that shift, okay, and you invest in yourself to be that version of yourself, to have that lifestyle, no one can take that from you. Yeah. It's like bulletproof armor, right? Because guess what? The good, the bad, the ugly, like we talked about accountability, you got to earn it. Something happens to me, it's Michael Ketchin's fault now. There is no paycheck coming in. There's no salary. There's no benefit. There's no pension. It's, it's me. It's me and me alone. That's what it means to bet on yourself. And as scary and as terrifying as that sounds, it is the most rewarding and most fulfilling thing you will ever go through. And you said something very important earlier. We as people tend to romanticize the process after the fact. I, it is so easy to lose touch of reality. But when you look back, and every now and then I think we have to, that's something I think I need to do a better job of, is looking back at where we started and reminding ourselves of what it was all for yeah. and enjoying those moments because that's easy. And that's where I think, again, I, I keep giving her credit, but back to my wife, she's much better at um, being present. That's something I struggle with that I think a lot of entrepreneurs do. But that's really what better on yourself is, is that total lifestyle design Good and bad. You might stumble and fail. You might have adversity. You've had plenty, but you're going to own it. And guess what? When you get to live the life on your terms that they call you lucky, that's when you're winning. The minute someone calls you lucky, you're winning because they have no idea about the journey you've been on. Absolutely. And it, it reminds me, there's this, I don't think it's a meme, but it was, it's a picture that I saw years ago and I shared it on social media. And it just came to mind when you said that there was a guy and he's not, it's a cartoon. He's on stage. And the way the picture is drawn, just to give everyone the visual, imagine a photo where the right side is like the audience, the middle is the stage he's on, and there's like a staircase going down that he had to walk up to get to the stage. And he's juggling plates on the stage. And he's got like 10 of them. And everyone's like looking at him with their eyes open, like, wow, he's so amazing. But when you see the staircase, which they don't see, but it's like a thousand broken plates along the way. You know, no one sees your journey. And that's actually, that's a good point too. I think given the world we live in now, especially with social media, it's really easy, especially for you know entrepreneurs, people that it's all on you and you're trying to figure it out. It's easy to start, but you know, everyone does this, not just entrepreneurs, this idea of comparison. And we compare really? ourselves to others based on what we see on social media or ads that we see or whatever it is like that. And I think that it's so easy to lose track of that, of the reality of the situation because most of the time what you're seeing is not real. Like it's so edited and polished and blatant lies <laughs> and things like that to the point where yeah. you go, well, my life sucks. Like, look at that person, but they've got their challenges. They've got their hardships and people don't talk about that in general on social media. They usually just post the highlight reel. And if yeah. you're looking at your behind the scenes and you're comparing it to the highlight reel of somebody else, you're going to feel inferior. But I often tell people, and I, I strive to do this in my own life. I compare myself with only myself. And I celebrate everyone, everyone else's success. And the reason is because when I was younger, there was this mindset, which now I think is a fairly toxic mindset that I'm glad is no longer present. And many of the listeners maybe experienced this at one time in their life or even now. This thought of if somebody else is winning, that somehow that means you lose. Or somehow that means that if they get more, there's less for you. And so especially if it's like a friend or it's someone that you 
you know and you just care about them and you see them succeeding, especially it's hard when it's something that you are not succeeding at that you want to succeed at. And you look at it and you go, I don't get it. Like, I'm, why isn't it working for me? If we come from more of the jealousy where it's like, I don't want them to have that, that I think is the toxic side of it. But when you can shift out of that and now it comes from, wow, first of all, congratulations to you because I can only imagine assuming I don't already know the level of work and effort you put into making that happen and all like the iterations that you had to go through to make it work, all the, the, the blood, sweat, tears that went into it. But just on top of that, you, you overcame. You overcame so many of the challenges, so many of the odds to make this happen. I don't know what you went through. And your, your success represents the possibility of what I can do. And so yeah. when I now get inspired by other people's success and I go, wow, Michael deposited three six-figure checks. <laughs> I didn't do that. <laughs> that would have been really cool. And I say, okay, like, what could I do using like that story coupled with like the Elon Musk quote, what can I do in the next six months to get some six-figure checks coming in? Yep. And now it's like awesome for him. I know he'll do good in the world with that. Good for his family. Good for all this stuff. And I can celebrate that with him. And like, hopefully he feels that genuine, the genuineness and, and other people experience that too. And I think that that just makes such a big, big difference. Celebrate everyone's success. Just compare yourself to where you are right now and to who you were yesterday. And then from that space, realize that if they can do it, you can do it. You can learn whatever you need to learn. There's plenty of things you know now that you can do well now that five, 10 years ago you couldn't do and you didn't know how to do it. And now you realize, oh, the future is the same way. What skills am I lacking to get to where I want to be? How do I go learn them? Who do I hire? What book do I read? What video do I watch? What community do I surround myself with? And day by day, get a little bit better and a little bit better. And then surround yourself with people that say you can do it. People, I remember hearing uh, Grant Cardone a uh, big real estate guy, author, and all that kind of stuff. And he had this great little video. He's like, if you're surround, if you are near Warren Buffett, you know, one of the richest people in the world, I think he's worth around a hundred billion. And let's say yeah, you say, insane, yeah. if you said to Warren Buffett, you know, Warren, I'm thinking about like, I want to make a million dollars this year. And the way Grant Cardone said it is Warren Buffett would look at you and be like, do it, man. Like, go ahead. Like, <laughs> like, because to him, a hundred billion, a million is nothing. But yeah. if you're around people that are thinking a lot smaller and you say, I'm thinking about making a million dollars this year, if they don't believe that they can do that, they typically project that out and they start trying to pull you down. And usually it's unconscious. It's not even malicious. They're doing it. on, And it's like they're, they're pulling you down by causing self-doubt. Yep. Or trying to plant seeds, rather. You can't cause it. Projecting. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And to your point, to jump in there, the thing I, I, I tell people this all the time, the thing that's been fascinating to me over the years as I continue to network and get around more and more um, um, financially successful people, because success comes in a lot of forms, but yeah. you know, for the sake of this conversation, let's talk financial. Cause I think that's a whole separate issue. Sometimes time freedom and all that stuff. But on, on terms of finance, I never continue to be amazed at how it, it's so different than what people, like when I grew up as, as a poor inner city kid, when I determined to be success and what I thought money acted like and behave like, these are the most, open, humble, coach me up, uh, make me better, add value, willing to help type of individuals. And the way we project wealth, again, back to that system, the way you're programmed to think. Why do we think wealth is bad? Why do we think of the, the Scrooge McDucks of the world of villains? Why do we project this on society so much? Why is that? No one ever stops and goes, you know, I don't know. I mean, there was a 1% before Elon Musk. He's just the latest guy, man. There was 1% before Jeff Bezos. You know, it's a capitalist society. The free market's built all these good things, right? So ask yourself, next time you go to pick up your Amazon Prime box that a guy took that risk on all those weekends to bring you, why you're mad at him? Who is making you mad? And then take a step back and realize the way the game is being played. Who told you you can't be Jeff Bezos? Why did you accept not being Jeff Bezos? If you want to grind and not see your family or friends for a decade straight, if you want to take on all those risks, if you want to move in and live in a garage and bet on yourself completely and enamor yourself and build that life, I guarantee you can do it. Do you want to do it? Do you want to go to the deep water? You probably don't. So stop blaming that guy for what you don't have. Take that total accountability and, and, and level up. Go get uncomfortable. Get in a room with those that are smarter than you and, and bet on yourself and start taking action.
Michael bringing the fire. <laughs> I get I get so fired up about it, man. I really do. I can see well, that. That's beautiful. Um, I want to just you said something that I think is important to bring up. You know, a lot of people think, you know, what is success? And you just talked about it. It comes in many forms. And just like failure, success doesn't exist. The concept. You get to determine what success is for you. So whether you're an employee somewhere, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're retired, whether, whether, whether you're a young kid and you're just starting off and you're still in school, wherever you're at on your journey, you get to determine what would an extraordinary life on my terms look like? What kind of day-to-day -day life do I want to experience? What kind of contribution would I like to have? What, what the, what's the legacy I want to be maybe known for? What impact do I want to have in the world, in my community, in my family, whatever it is. And when you're clear on that, going back to what I said before, only compare yourself to you. It doesn't matter if somebody's goal is to be a billionaire and you're completely content at 40,000. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, because the billionaire is probably not content <laughs> at a billion. <laughs> so you're probably better off in that respect. But from that headspace of, I often, you know, I had this thought years ago and it was so just simple, but change, game changing for me. I used to think, you know, like you were talking about, oh, success is this, like the certain you know, amount of money, certain like house, all that kind of stuff. And then the thought crossed my mind, well, there are millionaires and billionaires who have everything that I think would make me happy. And some of them are really miserable. Some of them even go as far as they might even commit suicide. Then there are millionaires and billionaires who are really happy. And then there's people who have practically nothing that, that I have, and some of them are really miserable. And some of them also have practically nothing that I have, and some of them are really happy. Yep. And so when we can realize, okay, it's happiness is an inside job. Success is an inside job. You get to determine what will make me successful. Screw everybody else's idea of what success is. Own your own life and come from that space of, at the end of the day, I look myself in the mirror. Do I like what I see? Or even better, do I love what I see? Can I look myself in the mirror and compare myself to who I was three months ago and see the work and effort I'm putting in and whatever the different areas, losing weight, building muscle, getting my finances in order, fixing my relationship, whatever it is. And I can look myself in the eyes. And at least for me personally, as a man, I might say like, well done, brother. Like you're doing oh, yeah. good, right? <laughs> and just from that space, if you can do that, you're shining, you're doing so well. But so many people, we live a life that's almost a lie. And so we're looking ourselves in the mirror and we don't want to do that too often because it's uncomfortable. We're, 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 we're collecting things. And to your point, I tell the story, the most successful guy I know is, is my lifelong best friend. And he did a very few simple things that we could all do. He took very intentional action and designed his life. The man is a gym teacher, which he loves. Gets to basically do middle school gym all day. He owns a house that he house hacks on a beach. His parents are one of his tenant with his brother in the basement. He Airbnb is the other side, so he eliminated his cost of living, and he gave his parents a nice retirement, very low cost of living. This is a first-generation immigrant, by the way. Okay, mm -hmm. so I don't want to hear those excuses either. All right? First-generation immigrant, moved here in first grade, kid couldn't speak English when we met. All right? Then, lives on the beach, walks his dog with his beautiful wife every day. I like to bust his balls because he's a 40-year-old man playing video games, but he likes his video games. He's in good shape. He works out. He does what he wants every single day. He is, I have been in the room with people with hundreds of millions of dollars. They are no more happy and no more successful than what I deem my buddy to be. Because oh, yeah. he was intentionally taking action. Both people are intentionally taking action. Both people are owning their choices. Both people are designing their lives. Yes. Success is what you define it. And then if you go achieve it. Yeah. Don't put a monetary value on it because you'll be chasing it forever. Money is a weak motivator. You will come up empty and hollow every single time. Yes. And I love that you just said that. It's like success. It's not a matter of... Um... It's not really a matter of what. This is, I'm going to kind of think out loud and kind of make sense of this. It's not a matter of what in terms of things, it, an amount of money, all that kind of stuff, like you said. Yeah. It's really in your heart, given the life that you've chosen to live, do you feel successful? Do you feel mm -hmm. like, yeah, I love my life? Like, you know, like that to me, like when I think about success, I've been asked this question, you know, recently actually a lot. Somebody might say, you know, what is success to you? And I used to answer this in very different ways. And now I think, and I say, okay, what is success to me? And I think first and foremost, I love myself and I love my life. Even during the challenging moments where it seems hard to, mm -hmm. I can reflect on where I've been and I can see, you know what? 
I've learned from those experiences, even if I maybe did things that in hindsight, I would like to have done differently. I learned from the experiences. And right now I'm doing the best that I can and I'm living life in alignment with what matters to me. Absolutely. And if I, you know, that's just my version of it, but I'm sure everyone who's listening can connect to some variation of that for yourself. And then the question is, are you living that life now? And again, it's not a matter of how much money's in the bank. It's a feeling, it's a way of being. You can get that right now. And if you were to come from that space, I think it's really incredible, the shifts that you'll experience. And so, Michael, so. something that I wanted to ask you, given the work you know, that you do, that I do, so much of it, if not all of it, is grounded in leadership. And you know, you've created immense success for yourself. Could you share with us, what is leadership to you? Uh, leadership to me is essentially not asking anyone who's working with you or for you to do anything you wouldn't be willing to do. Mm. Um, leadership is a direct reflection of the culture you create. And leadership is wanting to push yourself and your people to be better and the best version of themselves every day. Um, it's not always going to be easy. There's going to be a lot of pitfalls along the way, but that's where your culture comes in. And if you put good people in, good people are worth it every time, 11 times out of 10. You never go, no one ever went broke hiring good people. Um, and it takes a good leader to get the best out of it. You know, I look back on the gentleman who was probably the most impactful leader on me. And he was the guy, he's a former basketball coach. He's still in education, but he's the gentleman who led us. We did the impossible, man. And real quick, I don't want to bore you with death of the details, but me and him were in the room with the state of Massachusetts representatives. You can go check this all out, Google it all. Lawrence High School, Health and Human Services Academy, HHS circa 2014, I guess. We were the fifth worst high school in the state of Massachusetts. They actually said, if the state of Massachusetts had any more money, we would take over the school and fire you all now. You have a year to maybe two to figure it out. Now, what we didn't know on the backside is they already had a plan to redesign the school. But we became a curveball and a wrench in that because we turned around that school. We actually won awards from the state of Massachusetts our final year for becoming an accommodation school. And I look back on it now and, and, and I was always, thank God he saw something in me that I don't even think I saw myself at the time because I was a poor academic student and hearing him work in education, I kind of fell into that, but he saw my skill set and he played up my strengths. He minimized my weaknesses. He pushed me to be better. He held me accountable. It was tough love at a lot of times. I mean, we had explosive arguments for both fiery individuals. And even now, some of the staff, I look back, I get texts from staff today, like thanking us for what we did. But in the moments, I mean, there were people we were not an easy place to work. We had incredibly high expectations, but I'll tell you one thing. Everyone there knew he had your back. Yeah. And that's why I go back to being leadership. I'm not always here to be your friend. I'm here to build a culture where you know I'll support you, but I'll hold you accountable. And I saw what a good leader could do because in my opinion is, yeah, business is great, all that. What we did in that setting, I mean, I'm a decade removed now almost, and I still think of these lessons every single day. And it showed me that no task is impossible if you have the right people and the right people have the right leader. Hmm. That was so well said, man. I love that answer. Thank you for that. It, it reminds me of two things when you talked about, you know, he wasn't always your friend, let's say in terms of how your felt experience was, but oh, no. he had your back. You know, it, it reminds me of um, one of the agreements I make with people when they come to work with me is I'm here to serve you, not to please you. And I'm willing to say things that might make you uncomfortable in the highest service of you. And every single time, if, I, when, if and when that happens, you come back and thank me. <laughs> it, it, it does happen always. And it just, it's amazing. And when we think about this is a quote that comes to mind that I think you alluded to, the best leaders don't make more followers. They make more leaders. Yeah. And like you said, you know, you get good people, you build them up, you serve them as powerfully as you can. And when you've got an organization, I've, I've you know, read certain books, seen certain videos of people that are either billionaires or multiple, multiple, like $100 million plus people. And they say, oh yeah, like I'm the owner or I'm the CEO, but most people on my team, they're way smarter than I am. <laughs> and it's because you don't want to be the smartest person. Like you want to serve the wrong room. Time with the smartest people. Yes. He, he said something to me that stuck with me that absolutely terrified the living shit out of me when he said it to me. And he was so right looking back on it, but it, it put the fear of God into me in the moment. We were going through this redesign and he's put me on the administration team and, and he's doing all these things. And I go, all right, I see the next two years, but where do we go after that? This is before real estate. We're just, 
we have a mission. We have a goal. We're trying to transform the school. And he looks at me and he goes, if you're still here in two to three years, I failed you as a leader. And I went, what? I'm thinking, dude, you're going to fire me? Like, I thought we had it like... <laughs> back to the, the, these pivotal moments that it's funny i've never even shared that story out loud now i'm thinking about it but it hit me and it took me years i'm, I'm you know what i'm calling him as soon as this calls over i gotta call him and say thank you because here i am again a decade later talking about this now and in the moment i wasn't ready to hear i didn't even get what he meant but there he was instilling in me that confidence that i see something in you that you don't even see in yourself yet yeah. I never thought of myself as a leader. I'm, I'm, I'm a runner around crazy guy. You know, I just do me. Mm-hmm. And now I see that, that maturation. And again, back to the, I mean, we hit on all these things, surrounding yourself with people who will push you to be the best version of you. He could have easily tore me down that moment. He could have easily made it about him. He could have been selfish. He could have been self-serving. A leader pushes his people to be great. And that's, it's great, great story. So thank you for even making me remember that. That was a great moment. Yeah, yeah. Please reach out to that person. <laughs> like, me right now. Look at this. This is how good this guy is. He wrote his podcast. <laughs> I actually want to make a point about that. I love that this came out of this because a couple of years ago, this might have been last year, actually, a year or two ago, I did the exact same thing. I was a track athlete and my track coach for the four years I was in high school. Awesome guy. And such a pivotal part of my life was my track experience. And it grew me and matured me in so many ways. And you know, some of my best friends today, 18, 17 years later, something like that, I met in that team. And this guy's devotion, his commitment was to his runners, you know, and he'd been, he'd been at the school at the time for like 40 years and he's still there now. So it's probably like 60 years. Imagine that. And I gave him a call after not speaking to this guy for over 10, 15 years. And he probably thought I was trying to sell him something because I called him and I basically just wanted to let him know the impact that he had on my life. And he was so touched by that. And so my loving invitation and challenge is just like Michael just said, and just like I just talked about, I want you to list one, three, five, 10 people in your life that are either currently still in your life or that were in the past at some point who you would not be where you are now, potentially without them. And they meaningfully made a big difference for you. And maybe you never told them that. And you reach out to them like right now, you send the message, you send a voice message, you call them if you have their number and you just have that touch point, you have that reconnection. There's a story that I believe I heard this from Dr. Wayne Dyer years ago and it's along the same line, but essentially there was this student and uh, the teacher rather, and the teacher just put her life into her work and she never knew if her work made a difference. And she had this student who this one teacher believed in him so much, kind of like you're talking about, she was a leader. She believed in him so much. She just fueled the fire. She praised and encouraged him. She just loved him like crazy. And she had so much belief in him. That's why in like sixth grade or whatever it was, he ends up at 40 or 50 being massively successful. And he attributes all of it to her. And he's done all this good in the world. She's got no idea. And then he calls her one day thinking everyone at the school loved her. Everyone must have praised her like crazy. And when he called her, she was in a retirement home and she, she retired like 15, 20 years before. And she was a little bit depressed that she wasn't sure if her life made a difference. And apparently none of those students ever reached out to her. And when he did, it just touched her spirit it's so deeply. And every one of us right now has that power to do that. And so what if you send that appreciation video, that appreciation message, that appreciation phone call, you can make somebody's day so, so easily. Yep. Yeah. You're, you're spot on. So I can go make that call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. And so can you please take, a, I alluded to it in the beginning of our call. You have a show. Tell us why. Can you tell us about that? Yes. <laughs> and yes, why sir. it exists. <laughs> yes. So tell us why. The mission statement there is to build the podcast right now. We're doing a couple of things as well. Webinars, we're working on a great couple of eBooks, building out a website, tell us why podcast.com, trying to get a community on their forum type format. Essentially the idea is what is your why? What is your motivation? What is that deep thing that gets you up in the morning? Well, I was fascinated how I met Dr. Jamil. Entrepreneurs and business people and financial freedom seekers from different walks of life, different avenues all had similar threads. And sometimes we just needed to know what resource to share 
to help us all level up and continue to be better. We wanted to create a community for like-minded individuals like that. That's really my big belief. You might have gone from this podcast. I don't do the victim thing. I don't play that game. But I do believe we need more exposure. That's my key word. I want everyone exposed to these resources. Now, once they have the resources, you follow where you may, and I don't really care. But we need to level the playing field in terms of what questions do I even ask? What are the rules to the game to start playing the game? And that's what we're trying to do with Tell Us Why. That's wonderful, man. Thank you for doing that work. I love you said level the playing field. And that's good. Because like uh, I learned this from uh, Werner Earhart. He's the guy who started Landmark. And before that, it was Est in the 70s. And this idea of there's the things you know, the things you don't know. And the biggest part of the pie is the things you don't know that you don't know. <laughs> and, yes. And, and like, yes. <laughs> and like you were saying, maybe I don't know the questions to ask. It's not even in my, it's not in my world. I like guess I'm not in that perception Brother. at all. We could spend, you have no idea. I mean, that you want better, you, I tell people all the time, you want better answers, ask better questions. And that simple advice, people do not understand. I, I, you know, I'll end up going for another hour. I can't even get going. I have to do part two because, <laughs> yes, go back and listen to what this young man just said. And uh, this is an excellent episode. I love hanging out and chatting with you. Absolutely, man. And so the foundation of my work and of this podcast is to help people create an extraordinary life without regret. What advice would you have for someone in order to do that? Uh, hurry up and bet on yourself. Mm. I mean, stop, stop waiting. No, no one is showing up. No one's, no one's coming to save you. No one gives a shit. Bet on yourself. If, if you won't believe in yourself, why should someone else? Mm. Make Man. that mindset shift. Beautiful. And something that I think I might know your answer to this, but <laughs> what is either the biggest risk or decision that you've made that really changed your life that you're deeply proud of and why? I'm deeply proud of uh, the biggest decision I made that I'm really proud of. Um, I'll do two. One, as I mentioned multiple times in this podcast, was one was asking my wife to marry me because I never, that's a funny story in itself, but I, I never pictured myself with that. And that had a profound impact that's still paying dividends today. And two was, leaving education. I mean, you got to understand, I fought for so long to get certified to figure it out. Again, I fell into that industry. And then right when I arrived, right when I was at the peak, I got offered, I went back real quick story. I went back, turned down a job that they offered me in a school that I grew up not being able to get into <laughs> just to prove I could do it. And then I left and went and, and, and did the real estate thing full time. Uh, but it really was making that decision to go out on our own. It was terrifying. I mean, you go from having a paycheck to having this, to having that, having benefits. And we took that decision because we reminded ourselves too often. We say to ourselves, well, what could go wrong? Well, we should say, well, what can go right? Yes. And once you make that shift, that subtle shift, you know, it's game on from there. So that, that was probably my biggest one. Beautiful, man. I love that. And I think for everyone listening, you can tell one of the recurring themes of this podcast is, <laughs> is bet on yourself. You know, take a chance on you. And like Michael said, it's it'll likely be scary when you're going from what seems to be like the sure thing to something that is a possibility. But at the same time, like I said earlier, if you don't like what you're doing and you're in a sure thing, then the only sure thing is misery. But if where you're, uh, that's a good quote. I'm gonna, <laughs> sure, <laughs> I just made that up. <laughs> but if you're gonna create something, then <laughs> having too much fun on here we're, we're yeah. off the rails now oh yeah but we're finishing up but if you're you know going back to it if you don't like what you're doing and that's the quote-unquote sure thing the safe bet the only sure thing is you're going to be miserable if you're not now you're going to be in the future but if you realize that you know my heart my spirit is kind of calling me into something there's something that really excites me and then you start looking into it dip your toes in it and you realize oh there are people that make money doing this oh, wow, there's people that make a lot of money doing this. There's people that really impact the world doing this. Could I do that? And then just that, like, like, like your question, can I do that? How can I do that? Well, what do I need to learn? And it, it goes and goes and goes. And so as we wrap up, Michael, what are you working on now that's really exciting you? Oh, man, honestly, um, we're doing a, a lot of stuff with the business. Uh, we're trying to get closer to our goals. Our, our next big goal is when I was 40, I wanted to take a step back from the day-to-day -day of what we're doing now. Um, to continue to do more um, uh, giving back, more tell us why stuff. So we're, we're ambitiously every day trying to work towards that. 
building up the team, building up the processes, building up the portfolio to allow that. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm also just trying to be a better husband, a better person. It's, it's very hard to be present every moment. It's something we struggle with. Uh, I'm not great at it. I give myself a D. At least I'm up from an F. <laughs> and uh, try, trying to get to a C by the end of the year. You know, check in with me and my wife in a few months. We'll see where we're at. Yeah. Well, up from an F plus, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And so for our listeners, if somebody's wanting to connect with you, if they're wanting to, I'm not sure if people can work with you in real estate or some variation of that, what's the best way to connect with you? Absolutely. Uh, check us out on our Instagram at tell us why underscore underscore or my own personal Instagram is M Ketchen, K-E-T-C-H-E-N. Shoot me a message. It takes a little while to get back. I, I get a lot of inquiries every day, but I'm always happy. I respond to every one of them. It just might take me a bit, but I love talking this stuff. As you can tell, I'm always happy to give a hand and uh, yeah, happy to talk business or financial freedom, anything it might be. Fantastic, man. I'll have the links to the show in the show notes of everything Michael just said. And I definitely want to take you up on that part too, because I think we can keep this going. Oh my God, <laughs> you can't read the two of us. We'll be in trouble for hours. Oh yeah. Uh, and so for everyone listening, if you enjoyed this conversation, first and foremost, I strongly encourage you go through it again. I, one of my mentors says once for information, twice for transformation. And I love that. And from that space, Michael shared so many nuggets of wisdom that can change the whole perspective that you have right now on your life. And if, if any aspect of it landed, to me, that's the proof that you should go back and do it again. <laughs> and so go back, listen to it, and then apply. If you don't apply, nothing's going to change. And uh, pl please as well. If this resonated, share it. Share it with someone that you believe it can serve. Share it on social media. Leave a review, whether it's on Apple or Spotify or a YouTube comment or whatever it is you're going to do. That would really mean the world. Michael, is there anything you'd like to say before we close? I just want everyone to really bet on themselves. That's it. It's all I want. A perfect world. Just do it. Wonderful, man. Me, me as well. As I said in the beginning, my life's work is to help leaders, champions, and high performers create an extraordinary life without regret. If you're going through a challenge right now, going through a problem, or like I said earlier, if there's a goal, a vision, a dream that you have, you're working towards it, and you want to get there faster, I'd love to have a conversation with you. You can book that at my website, dreamailsiage.com. And if you're looking for new content, whether it's other podcast episode or any of the, I think, seven or 800 posts at this point that have been put out over the last six years, videos and all that kind of stuff. You can find it on Instagram at Dr. Jamil Sayage, which is DR and then my name. And Facebook and LinkedIn is just Jamil Sayage. Thank you all so much again for the time, the energy, the attention, your presence. Michael, again, thank you so much for being with us. It was such an honor to have you. I had a lot of fun in our conversation. So if anything, you've benefited my life and so hopefully <laughs> others as well. And again, the name of this podcast is Transformation Starts Today. And I called it that because what I have found is that most people's favorite day to change their life is tomorrow. And that's why they stay stuck because tomorrow never comes. Apply, apply, apply. Ask yourself, what would my future self thank me for? Go do that and create a meaningful rest of your day. Take care. Oh, thank you, Bill. Thank you for being with us today. If this conversation served you, it would mean a lot if you left a review and shared this with anyone who may benefit. An extraordinary life without regret is available to you now. Choose it. It's your time.